It's gonna walk off the top. Lisa's holding on. Like, I've got hold like down. I got his little here. tail. Stand mixers work wonders when you want to whip up baked goods like cookies, cakes, meringue, and breads. But if you're only an occasional baker, do you really need an expensive high-end model? Our previous Best Buy, the KitchenAid Classic Plus, was half the price of our winning high-end mixer. But since that testing, we've seen other less expensive models emerging. So is it still the best choice? To find out, we bought six of these new budget-friendly challengers and went to work. Here are the highlights. All right, so kneading is one of the most important things we looked at with these stand mixers. There are a lot of breads, if you want to bake them at home, you can't do them without a stand mixer. We chose two doughs to look at. One really stiff dough, a bagel bread dough, and one really sticky dough, a ciabatta. Both of these doughs need for extended periods of time. This one takes a four minute knead, followed by a 10 minute knead. So we're gonna start this one. We put a biga, which is you know, overnight, some water and flour, and it makes a real sticky, gooey mass that develops some flavor. And you start on the lowest speed. I'm gonna lock the head, and then we're gonna, can you put it on the lowest speed just to mix it for one minute? Sure, we've got the KitchenAid Classic here. Yeah. One minute. Mm -hmm. And that's just getting the wet and the dry mixed together. Yeah, you can already see some of the gluten forming. It's getting elastic. It's starting to cling to the paddle, come away from the walls. So it's been four minutes so far. We have another two to go. And then we have another 10 minute kneading cycle after this. Can you imagine doing this by hand? I'm sure it can be done. It's a very old bread, but this makes it 100% easier. So right on time. Right on time. We got our visual cue cleaning the sides of the bowl. That's what we're looking for, right? Yep. All right. Here we are, 10 minutes. Boy, it's really acquired a lot of, of chew already. The more tough that dough is at this point, the better that chew is gonna be when you make the bread. All right, so we've got the Hamilton Beach here. It's nice and quiet. There's a lot of areas where there's dry flour on the sides of the bowl. This isn't getting anywhere near them. Yeah, we're gonna have to stop and scrape this. Makes yeah. it slightly more annoying to use. Okay, so this is the first stage where it's supposed to have made a ball, and it hasn't yet. It smells like burning. It's rattling. That sound I thought was the dough slapping. Hannah was right. It's a rattling noise in the motor. It's got two minutes left to go, and it is, uh, it's going. All right. All right. You can turn this guy off, put it out of its misery. The dough itself looks really nice. So yeah, you made it. I don't know how much more you got in you. Um, we have two egg whites in here, and in each of the mixers we did two egg whites. We're going to mix them to stiff peaks, and we're going to time how long it takes and whether we have to stop and scrape down the sides. So you never do anything? No. I actually, I did this testing and I was like, I tried to help it one time. I picked up the whole thing and tilted it. That didn't help. We're going to call it. We call this. Yeah. All right, it's been five minutes. We've made no progress. This is a sign that this is not going to get in there and engage with all the ingredients right away the way a mixer really should. It just takes longer. It's more work to do the same recipe. Why bother? You're not saving anything by getting this machine. It's getting right in there. It's right in there. So it's nice and stiff peaks. That's what you want for meringue. You gotta incorporate a lot of air in there. This one's leaving a little bit of underneath, so it's taking a little longer to get there. Let's see how it does. So Cuisinart, decent job in performance. Not terrible, but... Yeah, this eventually got there, but it's not ideal. Most of these mixers could whip, cream, and knead pretty well, with a few exceptions. Some models just weren't as effective. Their attachments barely reached the bottom of the bowl, and some barely coped with heavy dough. Okay, on to our next round, ease of use. All right, so we are making a simple yellow cake, and we chose this recipe on purpose. We want, we want to look at creaming, but there's also, there's a lot of different ingredients, there's a lot going on. You add the butter piece by piece, so this is a good, real good ease of use test. And this one is called the Bosch Compact. It's probably the most unusual stand mixer we tested. It's really lightweight. It barely, you know, I think it's six pounds total. Ooh, <laughs> you have to be pretty precise. So you're looking through this tiny window to try to see what, what color it is and what, what it looks like. Yeah, and I that's mean, not ideal. Sometimes, you know, if you're creaming butter and sugar, you might be looking for the color to change. It's nice yes. to have a clear view. Exactly. Ooh, let me, am I gonna break oh, this? This is nice, it has a little rim on here so you can hold it with your fingers. I think that's good. Are we making progress? Mm, I don't know. I think we got to stop and scrape. There's some hunks of butter that are just traveling. Take, 
batter is making this thing jump around. That's not inspiring. This also has no handles, but it comes out pretty well. It's flipping down the sides. I'm getting a little grit on the sides. Oh, jeez. I can feel like I really am incorporating the last of it by hand. Yeah, I definitely see case. some chunks of butter. And look at those big lumps of butter still there. Now we're going to add half of the milk mixture, increase the speed to medium high. Really nice. It just really gets down in there and gets everything. Final stir by hand. I don't even have to look and see the directions here. I can see. I can just open it really easily. No, and you're doing it backwards. Which yeah. <laughs> there's no dry flour and it's really fluffy. Some models were definitely easier than others to work with. A few were just plain annoying or awkward to use. Other ones had to be stopped more frequently for repeated scraping. Those definitely fell behind in this round. On to our final round, design. All right, so finally we considered the design of the machines. We noticed certain ones were more productive, easier to use, all throughout testing. So we looked at certain factors like their weight, their dimensions, the distance between their attachments and the bowl. It's heavy. Um, you know, honestly, weight isn't always a problem. You want some weight to stabilize the machine, although we found some of the lightweight ones work pretty well. One problem is it's got a bit of a, oh, also we don't love the latch in the back, but yeah. it's got a, its head is really heavy, like, whoo. Feel that. Mm -hmm. it's it kind very of tall can slam too. up and down. It's tall, it's heavy. You'd think it would have prevented it from walking around, but it really mm. did shake a lot still. This is the easiest way to get out of space that you can't reach with your measuring tools. So, silly putty, highly scientific stuff. We got this and made a little cube out of silly putty that we put underneath the attachments. The ones with less space, obviously, between the bottom of this attachment and the bottom of the bowl, we're able to really get in there and, and engage the ingredients. It also tracks with ease of use because if you don't have to keep stopping and scraping because that could down there to the bottom of the bowl and mix the ingredients, it's an easier machine, everything will go faster. This had the widest distance which meant didn't incorporate everything, we had to stop more, we had to scrape things down more, so that makes it harder to use. Good clearance between the attachment and the bowl. Yeah, nice and close, so it could really engage with the ingredients. A little bit of an audible issue. Yeah, listen to this. Kind of... <laughs> a little bit of a dentist drill. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. It's, it also sounds like a jet taking off. It's like, Ooh. yeah. And then, ee, on the top, and you're like, oh. Just latch. Yeah. You can see already, this is pretty, pretty low. There's not a whole lot of space there. And we found all of the attachments to this one were pretty close. Yeah, this is very, this is one of the better ones. All right, so we've got the KitchenAid here. We examined it for design. The bowl didn't have a handle, which we didn't like. You know, it's easier yeah. to have something to hold on to. You can purchase a bowl with a handle separately. The overall profile of this and the design is very stripped down and very basic, um, but it does everything it has to do. It's nice and powerful, very simple to use. If you want to add some things on, you can. If you don't, you've got everything you need here to do anything from whipping, creaming, to kneading, the toughest doughs, and it all works. Two factors determined our rankings in the end. First, the weight of the mixer. Second, the size of the gap between the attachment and the bottom of the bowl. One model took the prize above all the rest. Lisa? The KitchenAid Classic Plus was our winner once again. This was the best buy from our high-end stand mixer testing and it surpassed all the other less expensive models. It's powerful and it's easy to use. For more info on our winner and the other inexpensive stand mixers in our lineup, check out the links below. Post your equipment questions in the comments and hit that subscribe button.